Hi guys. Okay, welcome to Accounting 100B. I'm obviously your instructor, John Lord. Uh, we're going to go through Chapter 11, as you can see on the screen today. Um, and um, it's important, if you haven't done so already, to please um, look at the welcome video that I had set up uh, for you. So you need to uh, look at that if you haven't done so already. Okay, so just taking a look at uh, e-learning. Okay, and um, let's go ahead and let that uh, log in for us. And you can see our class there. Okay, counting 100B and uh, 200B if you're uh, taking in that series, okay, synonymous. And then um, this welcome video right here. Okay, so hopefully you've watched that. If you have not, please go back and watch that. Stop this video, go back and watch that one at this time. Okay, because that's where you need to start. It's gonna explain the way the course is going to work. What I'm going to be going through in this discussion is these chapter 11 slides and um, you will, if you're watching this video, you've already seen that the video is posted up here. And that will be the case as we go through week to week. There will be chapter slides. There will be a lecture where I will go over the slides with you. Uh, these lectures can run, you know, a couple of hours. Uh, you can pause the video, take a break as you need to, resume wherever you pick up. Uh, pick up. Uh, those will be posted under each week's chapter uh, coverage. Um, a little bit later, there will be a second video that will be posted up uh, in which I will go through a practice midterm that will cover the information that we're going to be discussing in this lecture. Okay, and that'll be the structure week to week, slides, lecture, practice midterm. Again, if you're saying, geez, that's sort of a brief description of what we're doing, that's because you haven't watched yet the welcome video, which goes into detail uh, as to how that's going to work week to week. Okay. All right. So the main purpose of this video is to get us into um, the discussion here on the slides. The slides, as you saw, were posted there. I recommend you download the slides and um, highlight along with me as I go through the slides, uh, either printing out the hard copy. Sometimes you can do like maybe two slides per page. Um, or if you don't want to do that and you want to mark it on your tablet, etc., do that because I'll be making notes, etc., as we go through the slides. Uh, you'll obviously have the textbook as well, um, and you can do your detailed reading in this big old textbook, um, <laughs> you know, as you see uh, fit accordingly as you go along. Okay? All right, so let's just go ahead and let's jump ourselves into the slides. I'm going to put us in slideshow mode um, you know don't be offended if I'm not looking um, in the camera as I go through these you'll see that most of my attention will be focused down on the uh, on the uh, slides as I'm going through and marking them up etc okay all right good so let's just go ahead and take a look you can see that uh, the textbook information there again in the welcome video I provide you more detail we're going to start with chapter 11 and with chapter 11 we're going to start talking about depreciation of your uh, assets we'll talk about impairment we'll talk a little bit about depletion okay so just going over and taking a look at uh, the next uh, slide here and you can see that we're going to be spending time talking about depreciation Okay, we'll talk about different depreciation methods. We'll talk about asset impairment. We're going to see that uh, an entity is going to have to evaluate their assets for impairment at least annually. And if they've determined there's impairment, they'll have to write those assets down to the lower impaired value. We'll talk about depletion of natural resources a little bit. So what happens? We buy a piece of property and we're buying that property not so much for what we can use that property for on the surface, but what can we get when we go down below the surface and start mining out different natural resources? How will we account for that depletion as we move along? Okay, and then we're going to talk about uh, 
a little bit about the reporting, not so much uh, on that, but uh, just more of the mechanics of the depreciation, depletion, impairment. Okay, now, when we look at these different terms, uh, if we're talking about a fixed asset, we call that depreciation. Now, it's important that when we talk about fixed assets, we're not talking about land. Land is not depreciated. Land lasts forever. You don't have to depreciate land. Now, it could be that somehow uh, our land is uh, damaged. You know, there's an earthquake in the whole side of the mountain or something, or the land is, is damaged that way. We would write that off uh, when that, you know, sort of natural disaster, a sinkhole or something happened to that land, but you don't depreciate land. Okay, now if we're talking about intangible assets, what are intangible assets? Patents, copyrights, these sort of things. They call them intangible, as you remember from chapter 10 of the Kiso book, which was covered in 100A. We call them intangible. Actually, we're going to get to that intangible assets a little bit more, actually, uh, now that I recall in chapter 12, we'll get more into the intangible assets, but uh, they call them intangible because you can't really assess their value by looking at them. It's more what they, do they allow you to do. If you have the patent for some certain technology, that patent allows you to produce that technology unlike any other. Uh, copyrights, okay? The logo on this shirt is an NFL logo. That causes the uh, value of that shirt or the cost of that shirt to go up tremendously. Okay, so having the copyright to use this logo has value to it. Now, eventually, that value disappears. And so as that value disappears over time, we will, and instead of calling it depreciation, when it's an intangible, we call it amortization. Okay, natural resources, as we take that... Uh, coal out of the ground or whatever it is, we call that um, depletion expense. Okay, so just some terms there as we go through and uh, start to show the fact that um, over time we're going to have to recognize a systematic and rational manner for determining how the expected benefit of that asset will be used over time. So similar concept for each one of these um, Categories that we talk about here, only difference is we use different words for fixed assets, depreciation, intangibles, amortization, natural resources, uh, depletion. And again, we do not depreciate land itself. Okay, if we have some land that we're holding for development or future use, we do not have to depreciate that. You learned that uh, back in uh, chapter 10. Okay, all right, now you take a look, and I think. Um, you know that the original cost, okay, under the uh, rule of conservatism, we, under U.S. GAAP, we carry our fixed assets at original cost, okay? Then what? By the way, um, I mentioned U.S. GAAP there. International Financial Reporting Standards, we will touch on some aspects of those lightly from time to time where there's an interesting difference between U.S. GAAP and IFRS. Um, the United States, as you know, did not convert over to international financial reporting standards back in the early 2000s when everybody thought it was going to be inevitable that they would. They did not, and so um, we don't talk too much about IFRS in these classes. We'll hit on some interesting aspects. I won't be testing you much on IFRS, not at all, in fact. And when I say much, zero. I won't be testing on that. I might point out some interesting aspects from time to time as they come up. Uh, CPA exam anymore does not emphasize F IFRS, so we won't spend as much time with that uh, in this class as well, okay? But we'll point out some interesting aspects from time to time. So under US GAAP, you have IFRS. You, uh, under US GAAP, you have original cost. And then you will subtract off your uh, salvage value, and that gives us our depreciable base. Okay, so typically we will start our depreciation right there. We'll have a depreciable base, and then we will use that number to determine uh, what our depreciation expense is going to be from period to period. Okay, okay, good. Now you come over to the next slide here and you start to take a look at these different factors that will determine service life. 
Okay, so what we will do is we will depreciate the asset over its service life, over its usual life, okay, under its useful life, I should say, not its usual life, but its useful life. Now, when we look at some of these, what ends up happening is um, we will basically have to have a systematic way, a reasonable way of estimating what the useful life of an asset is is and so when you take a look um, they say the profession requires that we have a systematic method for depreciating it but we also have to be somewhat systematic somewhat uh, um, useful in the way we estimate the uh, service life okay so let me just go back and highlight the estimation of service life um, that is going to be done in uh, different ways okay service life could be number of years could be the number of units that the um, entity, that the, the piece of equipment or whatever is going to produce, that the asset's going to produce. There are different ways of doing that. Now, sometimes students will say to me, well, how do you come up with an objective way of doing that? Well, sometimes when you purchase a piece of equipment, the manufacturer will give you an estimate as to the useful life. Or um, maybe we've had an asset like this that we've used in the past. And so we know how long that asset should be used or how many units it will produce. Maybe we'll have our engineers come in and give us an estimate as to how many units can be produced or um, how um, many years that asset will last. Uh, the bottom line, it's really not so much the accountant's job to figure out the useful life of an asset as much as it is management's job to figure out that useful life. They would document how they reasonably came up with that. And then as accountants, we can use that to determine what our depreciation is, um, the carrying value of the asset, et cetera, as we go forward. Okay, so different factors go into that calculation really more the job of management to make sure that the accountant has the information that they need to be able to establish those uh, the estimate of those useful lives okay so we have these different methods activity method is basically going to say how many units is this particular piece of equipment whatever going to produce we'll use that to determine our depreciation straight line it's all about the years okay how many years are we going to use this asset? How many months are we going to use this asset? And that's how we'll calculate our depreciation. Now we have some methods of depreciation and the two that you see listed here are going to be sum of years digits and declining balance method. And what we do with these methods is we take more depreciation in the early years when we're first using the asset and then we take less depreciation in later years. And that sort of, um, if you will, estimates what happens with the activity method because when a piece of equipment is probably new, you get a new truck, you can use it for longer distances and whatnot, let's say, and so it's more likely that uh, you're going to use that more in the early years and as the truck gets older, you'll use it less in the later years, so lower depreciation in later years if you're using the activity method. What the um, decreasing charge methods use, we take more depreciation in earlier years, less in the later years, is it tends to try to simulate what the activity method does. Okay, So it is different than straight line, which is going to take an average amount of depreciation each year. Now we talk about these special methods that we'll get into a little bit later, group and composite methods um, we're going to see that there's some uh, interesting ways that you will go ahead and calculate your and the big deal there is the gain and loss um, that we won't recognize when we sell that asset off under uh, these group and composite methods okay okay good so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look and uh, look at this example, and we're going to start with the activity method that you saw on the previous slide, okay? And uh, these are pretty straightforward, guys. In fact, you may remember this a little bit from, um, you know, your uh, one, uh, 1A, 1B classes, okay? But let's just take a look. We have this crane, whatever that we have uh, purchased. The estimated useful life is five years. Estimated salvage value is uh, 50,000. And then 
relevant to this particular activity method example, uh, we think that we can use the machine for 30,000 hours. So we could come up with a rate per hour, we could come up with a rate per unit produced, and then we're going to use that to calculate our depreciation. In this case, we're going to do per hour. Okay. Now they've shown us the calculation down here. I'm not particularly fond of the way they uh, displayed that. So let's just go ahead and uh, use these numbers, but go ahead and write it in for ourselves. Okay. So we have what? We have the 500,000 minus the 50,000, right? That gives us depreciable base here of um, 450,000, right? 500,000 minus 50,000 gives us 450,000. Then we're going to take that and we're going to divide it using the activity method by these 30,000 hours, right? Right there, okay? And that's going to give us a depreciation rate of $15 per hour. Okay, $15 per hour. And then in this particular example, they told us that in this year they used 4,000 hours of uh, activity with that, right? Because we're coming up with an amount per hour. So we simply multiply that $15 per hour times the 4,000 hours, and that gives us now depreciation expense of 60,000. Now, um, it is important, guys, in accounting that you understand journal entries okay this is showing us the calculation but if you can't turn this into a journal entry as an accountant you have not completed your job at that point right so i'm just going to show you for this example regardless of the method that we use to calculate the depreciation we would debit depreciation expense what sixty thousand and we would credit accumulated depreciation i'm going to abbreviate that ad accumulated depreciation sixty thousand now just for higher understanding whatever let's say the next year we use that equipment for five thousand hours well in year two now i'm assuming let's say year two we would take the what take the five thousand times the $15 an hour, right, that we are uh, depreciating this asset using units of activity, and I don't do any calculation without a calculator. I don't do anything without a calculator, okay, guys? I'm good at accounting. I'm not good at math, so I do everything with a calculator, and I recommend that you get in that habit as well, okay? So 50, uh, 5000 times $15 an hour, would equal what 75,000 and so in year two the entry would be what debit depreciation expense now going for year two I'm going to strike out what we did for year one debit the depreciation expense credit the accumulated depreciation okay all right pretty straightforward pretty logical method probably the most reliable method of coming up with your depreciation because it's based on how much you actually use the asset. The more I use the asset, the more the depreciation. If I use the asset a little less, the depreciation is less. Now what happens though is to do this, we have additional record keeping. We're going to have to track the number of hours that we use that equipment year to year. Or if we were using a vehicle, we'd go by miles. We'd have to track the miles that we're going to use in the vehicle each year. Now you may say, well, that's not that hard, John. Just go from the beginning mileage at the beginning of the year, mileage at the end of the year, subtract the difference. That's how much you used it. Well, that's fine if you only have one, say, delivery truck or you have a small fleet of trucks. If you're what? FedEx. Now what? Now you're going to have, you know, a whole fleet of trucks, planes, whatever else, big trucks, small trucks that UPS or, or a FedEx would use, okay? And so what happens? It might be a little bit more difficult. Now, I'm sure these days they probably have software that would be able to track the mileage, right, using GPS technology and whatnot, track the mileage that different vehicles use, but it's important that the software also would be able to do what? 
update the accounting system, okay? Because if you're sitting there and you have the system that tracks the hours, but then you have to enter that uh, mileage into an accounting system, let's say, then it starts to become, again, a little bit uh, difficult to keep track of how the hours or miles that are used affect your depreciation calculation. So I'm sure by now there's have software that has actually allowed the accounting system to be updated as say a GPS based system tracks the mileage, etc. Okay. Now um, the straight line method basically focuses on the years. Okay, so when you go with the years here, notice it's the same depreciation base, right? 450,000. Okay, but now instead of using the miles here, we use the years. Okay, and you learn this in, you know, introductory. We take the 450,000, divide that by the five years, that's 90,000 per year. And now we would debit the depreciation expense 90,000. Credit the accumulated depreciation, 90000 taking it per year. Now, obviously, this is not as precise, not as reliable, um, not as accurate as the uh, units of activity method. But maybe, you know, because it's fairly close and there's not a real material difference between maybe using the activity method versus the straight line, or the cost of that precision um, outweighs the benefit on the financial statements. You don't get a big difference, and so it's easier to use straight line, etc. Um, we could go ahead and use uh, straight line. Okay, very simple method. I think you remember how straight line works. Now we also have these accelerated methods, and again, as I mentioned a minute ago. The accelerated methods are intended to really probably emulate what activity, you know, to simulate, if you will, what units of activity would do. Okay, again, usually use an asset more in its earlier years and less in its later years. So, what uh, some of your digits in a minute when we'll look at uh, declining balance methods use is they take more depreciation earlier less depreciation later, which is probably how you use an asset. Um, you know, if you were using units of activity, that's probably what it would, how units of activity would end up uh, showing the depreciation. Uh, straight line, it's the same amount every year, okay? Now, when you look at the, um, the sum of years digits, okay, and whoever thought of the sum of your digits method, um, you know, must have had way too much time on their hands, okay? Because what they realized is if you add up the years, and you add up the years, and if it's a five-year life, fifth year plus the fourth year plus the third year plus the second year plus the first year, right? You add up the sum of those years, that gives you the denominator 15. Okay, now it's important that uh, I won't do this to you, but like if you were taking the CPA exam, they might give you, you know, an asset with a 50 year life and you don't want to sit there going 50 plus 49 plus 48 plus 47. No, not the way to do it. Uh, for longer lives, it may be better to use this formula. For our class, I'm not going to give you an exam question that has an asset life longer than five years, but I would expect you to understand five plus four plus three plus two plus one is 15. And then the way you calculate the depreciation once you have that sum of the year's digits is you would go ahead and in the uh, first year, you would take five fifteenths, second year, four fifteenths, three fifteenths, two fifteenths, and by the time uh, you were done with that, you would take 115th. And notice, guys, we're still using the depreciation base, 500,000 minus the 50,000. And by doing that, at the end of that um, five-year period, you would have taken depreciation expense of 450,000. Your accumulated depreciation would have 450,000. And the assets carrying value, book value, at the end of the five years would be 50,000, which equals our, um, our uh, salvage value, okay? So again, debit depreciation expense, all right? Just look at that first year, 150,000. Credit the accumulated depreciation, 150,000. 
right? And then in year two, this would turn to what? 120, etc. Okay. All right, good. So that's how that works. Um, notice, guys, that as the years go by, because we're taking a smaller fraction, we take what? Lesser depreciation in the later years. And that's probably how you use most assets. You use them a lot when you first get it. Brand new machine, brand new vehicle. The vehicle starts to slow down a little bit. You're not using it for long distance deliveries anymore. You probably use it less in the later years. So it's trying to emulate the units of activity method here. Okay, or trying to estimate a little bit how the units of activity might uh, show depreciation for this particular asset. Okay, the other um, method that uh, takes more depreciation in the earlier years, less in the later years, is called declining balance. So what happens as we go forward, the balance in the uh, book value of the account, the carrying value of the account, as it comes down, our depreciation comes down. Thus the term declining balance. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to leverage off of our straight line. Okay, so we're going to be seeing what the straight line would give us, but then we're going to increase that straight line and we're going to provide that increased straight line percentage against a ever declining um, balance and that's going to give us more depreciation in the earlier years and less depreciation in the later years. Now, we do not deduct salvage value here. So when you look for units of activity, for straight line, for um, some of your digits, we use that depreciable base. Here, we're not going to use the straight line in the calculation, but very important, we will not depreciate below salvage value. So once we hit salvage value, we will stop depreciating uh, under the uh, declining balance method. Um, even though um, we don't use it in the calculation, again, we will not depreciate below salvage value. Okay, so let's just take a look and you see this is not that difficult. So the first thing you would do is figure out what the straight line is. And once you figure out the straight line percentage, then you will go ahead and, uh, and in this example, we're using double declining balance. So since we're using double declining balance, okay, this is double, this example is double declining balance. Let me write the word double in there. And of course, I was just a little bit annoying because I always have to do two clicks to get to the thing that I want here. But since this is double declining balance, Okay, double declining balance in this example, then we're going to take double the straight line. So since the straight line percentage is 20%, if we double that, we go to a 40% double declining balance. Now that's one way to calculate it. You could go one divided by the five year life. One divided by five is what? 20% per year times two gives us what? 40%, right? Now look, you could have an asset that has a four-year life, okay? If it was a four-year life, one divided by four years means that I'm doing what? 25% per year, and if I doubled that, that would be 50% double declining balance, and so on, okay? I think you um, can see how that works, okay? Now, so since in this example, though, we were at 40%, right? We had a five-year life, 20% per year. That's double that is 40%. Uh, oh, very important. It doesn't have to be double declining balance. It could be triple declining balance. So if it was triple declining, we would take 60% per year. So double declining is the most common, but you got to look at questions carefully. Make sure you understand, is it double? Is it triple? Is it 150%? If it was 150%, then you take the 20%. What does that come to, um, you know, for straight line for 150% comes to what? 35%, whatever it is. Okay. All right, good. So make sure you know what you're doing in this. Uh, most of the examples you see are double, but it doesn't have to be double. Okay, but this one was double, all right? And so we go ahead, 500,000 times the 
40% double declining balance means my depreciation expense for year one is 200,000. Year one, I debit depreciation expense 200,000, credit accumulated depreciation 200,000. So now the carrying value of the asset, the 500,000 minus the two, gives me an end of year book balance up 300,000, right? The cost of the asset minus the accumulated depreciation always gives me the book value, okay? Now I have that book value. I take that book value, that carrying value, and now I multiply it in year two by 40%. That gives me depreciation of 120,000 in year two. So now my accumulated depreciation is what? 320,000. 500,000, the original cost, minus the accumulated depreciation of 320,000, gives me a declining balance that I'll use for year three of 180,000. 180,000 times 40% gives me 72,000. Now my accumulated depreciation is 392. 500,000 minus 392 brings me to 108 and so on. I use that for year four to calculate my depreciation. Notice what's happening here. My depreciation is getting less as the years go by, thus simulating what would happen if I was using units of activity by taking more depreciation in the earlier years and less depreciation in those later years. Now, very important point here. If you were to take the what? 64,800, let's just write that number down, 64,800, and if you were to multiply it times 0.40, okay, then, again, guys, I don't do anything without a calculator. Sometimes you'll see me just write down numbers. That means I put them on my calculator before the class started. 64,800 times 0.4, my double declining balance, would have given me depreciation of 25,920. Now what happens? If I were to take the depreciation of 25,920, that would bring the salvage, the uh, carrying value, I should say, of that asset down below the salvage value. <clears throat> you can't do that. You do not depreciate below salvage value. So uh, in that fifth year, they only take depreciation at 14,800 so that they don't depreciate below salvage value. So at the end of the fifth year, the asset is carried at its salvage value of 50,000. Okay. All right. Very important. Doesn't have to be straight line. Okay, could be, I mean, it doesn't have to be double declining balance. It could be a different multiple other than double of the straight line and do not depreciate below salvage value. Two key important things to keep in mind. Now we want to go ahead and take a look, and uh, they don't call this out in the uh, slides, but I just want to review a little bit what happens if we dispose of this asset, we sell it. Okay, so let's just say we decide to sell this asset in year four. I know that in the problem they contemplate that you held it to five years, but let's just pretend, change the facts up a little bit here and say, well, let's say we sell it in year four. Well, if we sell it in year four and the carrying value is 64,800, and then if we sell it for, say, cash of 70,000, all right, and the book value of the asset, BV, is book value, is 64.8. Then we're going to look at that difference. We're selling it for more than what our balance sheet is showing is the value of that asset, the carrying value of that asset. So I go ahead, the book value of that asset. So I take the 70,000 minus don't do anything without a calculator, 64,008, we're experiencing a gain here. We've gained on the sale of this equipment, okay? So what happens? Now we have to make a journal entry to recognize that we have sold this equipment. So since we originally purchased the equipment for 500,000, and the accumulated depreciation on that is 435,200. We want to remove the equipment account. We want to remove the um, accumulated depreciation account. And then we want to go ahead 
and we want to uh, recognize the gain or loss on that. Now, if you were to think of the, you know, T accounts for the equipment itself, right now, the equipment has what? When we originally purchased it, we debited equipment, credited cash, whatever, for 500,000. The accumulated depreciation right now has what? Has this 400 and 35,200. Well, we need to zero those two accounts out. That equipment, we're selling it, right? So what will we do? And when you put together a journal entry like this, guys, you don't have to go in order, figure out all the debits, then figure the credits. Just put down the things you know. So we know that we got what? We got cash. And the cash was, in the example that I'm giving here, 70,000. So we debit cash. We know that we have to get rid of the equipment. So I'm going to go out of order of you know debits and credits I know debits then credits but you don't always have to do that you know you gotta get rid of the equipment account credit it for 500 that will close that out then what then you have to debit the accumulated depreciation to close it out 435,200 okay and when I look at my journal entry here now 435,000 200 plus what plus uh, 70,000 is going to give me what 500,000 505,200 debits got equal credits that never changes and so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to credit this gain on sale of equipment or whatever for that 5,200 gain so you could go ahead and figure out the gain by looking at journal entry as well now when I report that gain that gain is going to appear on the income statement, okay? But it's going to be what? a It's going not going to be part of my continuing operations. It is going to be part of my continuing operations, but it's not going to be my operating activity. It's going to be listed down as non-operating activity going back to your earlier 100A discussion about the way we present information on the income statement. So that gain is part of continuing operations, but it's what? Non-operating, okay? Selling your equipment is considered non-operating. Uh, gain, in this case, gonna increase net income. Uh, loss, obviously, would decrease net income, okay? All right, good. So that's the way that's going to look. Um, they give you an example here for methods of depreciation. Um, they go through the methods we just reviewed. I'm going to let you look at that on your own. So the slides are in there. We're not going to discuss them here because I think you get a sense as to the mechanics. The main thing I want to point out, though, is if you put an asset into use after January 1st, you have to calculate a partial year's depreciation. So in this case, they didn't put this asset into use until August 1st. So it would be what? It would be used all of August, all of September, all of October, all of November, all of December. Five months, guys, count them on your fingers, okay? I do that so that I don't make a mistake. So it's five out of the, of course, you know there's 12 months in a year, and so I would take that five twelfths times my depreciation expense that I calculated using the methods that we just described. Those are for the full year, so I only take a partial year's depreciation. And that only occurs for that first year when I put that asset into use, um, you know, um, not on January 1st of the first year. Going forward in subsequent years now, I'll depreciate that asset using the methods we talked about for the full year of year two, three, four, five, et cetera. But in that first year, if you, um, you know, purchase the asset, um, you know, after the year start, then you only take a partial year depreciation. Okay. Okay, good. And I'm, again, I'm not going to go through that. You see that 512 partial depreciation. And then notice in the last year, uh, using straight line, they take the uh, 712 here um, of the annual depreciation expense because presumably at that point they had uh, depreciated that asset down to its salvage value. Okay, and they went into that next year, had a five-year life, so since they only use it five years in the first year, five months in the first year, then they would still have some life left presumably in that uh, now it's essentially a sixth year, but um, we only go for seven months to make up the full uh, you know, period, 60 month period for that five years. Okay, and you can see the uh, 
first year depreciation expense entries we've talked about, but now you're only taking it for five months instead of seven. Okay, that was all they were bringing in there. I'm not going to redo the examples again. It's just simply taking the 512s as you go along. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, so I'll let you look at that on your own because see the mechanics are very much the same. So let's just take a look at uh, what we're calling special depreciation methods and what we're really talking about is group and composite. And the only thing uh, difference really between the two methods is that group is the term that we use if we're depreciating uh, similar assets in a particular pool, whereas um, if the assets are dissimilar, then we would simply, and it's a simple definition thing, guys, we would simply call that then, um, uh, if it's dissimilar, we'd call that composite. Group, similar, composite, dissimilar. Okay, now you take a look, and uh, that's the same thing we're saying there. Okay, now you take a look at the next slide, and um, we have these different items here, and um, we are sitting there, and notice we calculate the annual depreciation, and we're assuming straight line here. We calculate the annual depreciation for each one of these, add that together, divide that by the original cost, and we're sitting here, and we're saying, hey, we're depreciating this asset 25% per year, or you could take the 424 and divide it by 3.39 years, and that's gonna give you the uh, 56,000 per year that you're taking in depreciation on this. So we just take that depreciation, depreciation, depreciating these all as a group. If it's similar, composite, if they are dissimilar, okay? But the calculation is no different. Now, where uh, I want you to make sure that you're comfortable is what happens when we sell that asset. And remember when I showed you when we dispose of the asset, we sell it, we calculated the gain or loss when we were using straight line declining balance, etc. If you're using group or composite, and this is the key takeaway from this uh, group or composite discussion, instead of calculating a gain or loss, what happens? We sold... I don't know, they call them cars, trucks, campers, the one that was for 5000 um, that uh, we got. Uh, where's that asset? We sold something that had an original cost of 5000 and we sold that for uh, $2,600. Of course, you know you have to credit that asset to get it off the books. You know that you have to uh, debit the cash for the amount of cash that you got. But rather than calculate a gain or loss, you just go ahead and debit the accumulated depreciation for the difference. So, you know, I don't like to use the term plug too much because um, very, very few things in accounting are an actual plug. You hear that a lot. It's just a plug. That's a plug figure. And people say that. And I can almost always show you how you calculated that. It's not so much a plug. Whereas this is a true plug. Okay. This is the difference between the cash that you got and the credit for the original cost of the equipment. That difference gets plugged. I kind of hate that term, but it gets plugged to what? Not gain or loss, accumulated depreciation. So you don't do the gain or loss, okay? The resulting gain or loss basically goes to the accumulated depreciation account, okay? Sometimes students will say, well, what happens if you sold it for more than 5,000? Highly unlikely. I think it is highly unlikely that after you've used an asset for some time, that you would sit there and be able to sell that asset for more than you paid for it. That almost never happens. If it does, then I guess there would be a credit to the accumulated appreciation for that situation, but I don't see that you'd be able to sell this for more than you had originally uh, purchased it for, so I don't think you need to worry about that. Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and uh, again, we've talked about this a little bit, but let's look at depreciation for partial periods, okay? Um, then we're going to see what happens if we have to consider, um, we kind of looked at that already, but we're going to take a look at um, 
um, this third point really right here, what happens if we have a revision in our depreciation rates, okay? So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at some of these slides, okay? We're gonna see how those are going to look um, here in a couple of minutes, okay? Okay, guys, so let's go ahead and uh, continue on here and take a look at um, what they're calling other depreciation issues. Uh, but basically, what we're looking at here is what happens after you've depreciated an asset for a while? Um, how should I? And then as I go along, I realize, well, wait a minute, I have a truck, let's say, that had a 10 year life. And let's say I get through and I depreciate it a couple of years and then I realize, uh-oh, this asset actually only had a five-year life, right? You might understand that as you move along and you start to use that asset. How should you go forward calculating the depreciation? And the key word there in that little synopsis is forward, okay? When you change your estimate of the life, useful life of an asset, like in that example, then what you have is a change in estimate. And what happens? Change in estimates are part of what happens in accounting. Financial statements are full of uh, estimates. And you do not, you do not um, restate, okay? There's no change in previously reported results. So let me just go ahead and put that down as do not restate financial statements. When you have a restatement, that's a big thing, okay? Do not restate financial statements for change in accounting estimate. Do not restate, okay? That's a, um, you know, that's a big deal when you have a restatement. And if we restated our financial statements every time we had a change in estimate, we'd constantly be restating the financial statements. And what that sound you hear is the investing public saying to us, we don't trust your financial reports. Every year you have a restatement. What's going on? How do we know that we can rely on those? So we change restatements for things like corrections of error, that sort of thing, okay? And you talk more about accounting changes in accounting 305, so that's not really the point of this discussion, other than for you to understand that you have a change in estimate, you do not restate. You simply use that new estimate for the current period, the period that you have uh, determined when that change in estimate was made, and future periods. Okay, so they call that perspective, okay? The current period and future periods. No restatement. There's no going back and fixing last year's financial statements because you had a change in estimate, okay? So you go ahead and we say that, uh, let's look at this example. Arcadia purchased equipment for 510,000 was estimated to have a useful life of 10 years, okay? And a salvage residual value, salvage value, are synonymous of 10 years. Depreciation has been recorded using straight line for seven years. And in 2020, year eight, it is determined that the total estimated life should be, and instead of the uh, 10 years that we've been using, we realize, hey, this thing's got a little longer life, 15 years, and we need to bring that residual value down from uh, 10 to five, okay? So let's go ahead and see what we should do. First off, there again is no entry to correct prior periods depreciation. You do not go back and change anything. What you do is you calculate your depreciation expense for the year of change, 2020, and you'll use that new estimate of your depreciation expense for the years going forward, okay? So let's just go ahead and take a look, we would have originally for the first seven years taken that 510 original cost minus the 10,000. Salvage value gives us 500,000 depreciation base divided by the 10 years. And so for years uh, one through seven, for seven years we would have taken 50,000, all right? Then what? Then at December 31st, 2019, the asset would have had a carrying value, book value, synonymous terms, book value, carrying value of 160,000. Now what happens? 
in year 2020, we said, oops, you know what? This asset's actually gonna last a little longer, but it's gonna have a lower salvage value. So you take the ending book value for 2019, you subtract off the now new residual slash salvage value. That gives me a new depreciable base of 150,000. I have what? Eight years remaining, okay, just to make sure we're clear where we came up with that eight years that are remaining, that's what? That's the 15 years now, our new estimate of the life, minus the seven years we've already taken. That means that there's eight years left, right, on this equipment. So that's where that eight years come in. And so now we'll have journal entry for 2020 of 19,375. And then uh, we'll do that journal entry in 2021, 2022, as we move through uh, the remaining eight years. Okay, so we do not go back. We simply use the new estimate in the year that the new estimate is determined and in future periods. Now, the only thing you'll see in some of your practice midterm questions um, that I'm gonna show you a little bit later you'll see some cases where they like to trick you a little bit, okay? Where they'll say, well, the entity decided in November of 2020, and they give you this new estimate information. Well, that's kind of trying to trick you and to say, oh, okay, well, I have to use the old estimate for the first, you know, uh, 10 months, and then I'll only use the new estimate for years 11 and 12. <clears throat> no you use that new estimate for the entire year and the year that you made that change in the estimate. I don't care if you decide that new estimate on December 31st, 2020, you'll use that for the entire 2020 and going forward, okay? Okay, good. Now let's go ahead and take a look at impairment. So what happens? When impairment uh, requirements say is look, every year, at least annually, okay, it doesn't have to be annually, okay, but every, uh, at least annually, companies are required to evaluate assets for impairment. We're supposed to do that at least annually, okay? And so you can see the different things that might lead to impairment. I'm not gonna read through all of these. They're somewhat self-explanatory. The equipment becomes obsolete. Um, there's some problem with legal factors whatever okay company needs to evaluate that their assets if their assets have impairment and if they do then they may need to take um, a loss for that impairment now the mechanics is how we go through that though is a little bit i don't want to say difficult but you got to think through and uh, see what the key steps are here that we have on this slide so let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this one and see what sort of steps we have to do for impairment, okay? So we have to evaluate the assets annually and we need to look at recoverability. We have to do a recoverability test. And that recoverability test basically takes the sum of the expected future net cash flows, okay? Now, when you look at this, guys, just to make sure that we're clear, this is un... Eh. These pens are annoying. And I don't know why Microsoft can't make this better. I don't know why they don't have a palette of colors like they do in their other software that I can choose from here, but they tend to want to hide that for some reason. But anyway, so I can go ahead and I can, uh, when I look at these net future cash flows, these are undiscounted. And I'm not going to be happy with the way I wrote that. When we look at these net future cash flows, okay, those cash flows are undiscounted. By the way, guys, as you probably have determined by now, I have terrible handwriting. Never was good. It's even worse on uh, using the you know pen and the tablet and all that. So I will always call out whatever I'm writing. Okay, so it's better to listen to my voice to see understand what I'm writing than to try to read the screen sometimes. Okay, but it is undiscounted cash flows. Okay, we take all the cash flows. If we think that we're going to be able to generate cash flows of a dollar a year on this asset for the next hundred years then we would take a hundred dollars as the undiscounted cash flows right okay and then we're going to go ahead 
and see if those undiscounted cash flows okay are less than the carrying amount of the asset if that's the case then impairment has incurred because you're not going to recover the cost as to what you're carrying that asset so in that example if we were carrying the asset for two hundred dollars and the undense kind of cash flows were a hundred we have impairment because we're not going to recover that cost okay now if there is impairment we have to do that sort of step one there okay if this has occurred we have impairment now if the undiscounted cash flows are more than the carrying value so say the undiscounted cash flows were 300 and the assets being carried at 200 well now we're going to recover that 200 so we don't have impairment we wouldn't do anything else but if again the uh, un undiscounted future cash flows are less than the carrying value we have impairment and then we would move to step two okay and in step two now we're going to look at the fair value of the asset okay and generally fair value is determined now by the present value in other words discounted cash flows so we would take those same cash flows okay that were undiscounted up here the hundred dollars and obviously the discounted cash flows might be what might be eighty dollars of course we'd have to figure out what that discounted value was but let's say the uh, uh, discounted cash flows are eighty the assets being carried at what being carried at um, um, 200 in our example if I'm remembering our example correctly 200 discounted cash flows are 80 we have impairment of 120 and we would have to take that impairment at that time okay so I think it's useful we're gonna give you a numeric example here in a second but I think this is a useful slide as to the logic here right and we're gonna go through an example here in a second but let's say that my expected future cash flows are less than the carrying amount okay if expected future cash flows are not less that's the no then there's no impairment again expected future cash flows are 200 and the are 300 and the assets being carried at two i don't have any impairment okay now and i stop there i don't have to do anything else okay so this is step one always got to do step one and then step two only happens if you have determined that the undiscounted future cash flows are less than the carrying value of the assets so now assets 200 and the uh, undiscounted cash flows are 100 yes I have impairment if I have impairment then what I'm going to have to do is go ahead and figure out what the fair value is of the new asset okay and once i figure out what that fair value is probably using discounted cash flows now and they tell us what to do if the asset is held for use i'll take an impairment loss and that impairment loss is going to be the difference between the carrying value of the asset and the fair value of the asset i guess that yellow is okay which is uh calculated the fair value is probably calculated discounting cash flows in fact let's mark this thing up a little bit for a second guys okay i don't want to go there yet okay let's mark this thing up for a second okay because i just want to make sure we're clear on that undiscounted versus discounted cash flows right here net cash flows you can write in these are undiscounted cash flows use undiscounted cash flows for that step one for the step two test assuming you need to go to the step two test when you're using fair value fair value is often determined using discounted cash flows okay now what happens the difference between the carrying value and the fair value which would probably be figured out using discounted cash flows that difference now uh, is my loss on impairment I go ahead I debit impairment loss credit the asset account that brings the asset account down to a new uh, book value and then I go ahead and I depreciate that new cost basis that new book value and restoration is not permitted I cannot write it back up now if 
the loss is coming because I'm going to not use that asset anymore and I'm getting ready to dispose of it, then again, I'll take the impairment, okay? I do not depreciate that asset any further because if I'm getting rid of it, there's no use in depreciating it. I can restore, but not in excess of the original book value. Not in excess of original book value of that asset. I cannot write it up above where I started when I took the impairment loss. I'm capped there, okay? So you come over and you take a look at um, at the um, example here, okay? And so we have expected future cash flows. These are undiscounted, again, Sometimes the key thing is just remembering when you do and do not discount the cash flows. These are undiscounted cash flows, okay? And we had the original cost of the asset was eight. Accumulated depreciation is two. This asset has a carrying value of 600,000. Are we gonna recover this? Yes, because we're gonna generate cash flows of 650. We stop, that's it. You stop right there, that's step one. You don't have to go any further because we have no impairment here. Did they say that somewhere on this slide? Yeah, there it is. Okay, so I'm gonna put the stop up there as well because you don't have impairment, you stop. You don't have to do another thing. Why? Because the undiscounted cash flows were more than the carrying value of the asset, okay? Now you come over and you take a look at uh, the next example and now the expected future cash flows are 5A. Again, these are undiscounted. This is the second scenario for step one. This is still step one now, just change up the facts a little bit. Now the undiscounted future cash flows are only 580, and we have what? We have a carrying value of 600. Since the undiscounted cash flows are less than the carrying value, we have impairment. Now we've got impairment, so now we have to do what? Now we go to step two. Okay, and so when you go to step two here, now what happens? Well, here's that fair value. Here's, the, uh, we, we figure out the fair value. And again, that fair value is probably figured out using discounted cash flows. Okay, so I think you're seeing that I'm making a big deal out of this term, whether we discount the cash flows or not. To determine impairment, do not discount. To calculate the amount of impairment, do discount. So now we take those same cash flows, we discount them, and we determine now that the uh, fair value of the asset is 525. We compare that to the um, book value. This, of course, is step two, right? And you only do that when you determine you have impairment. And we have an impairment loss of 75,000. So we go ahead and we make the journal entry. We debit the impairment loss. We credit the accumulated depreciation. And um, they tell us um, on this next slide, okay, just going over, um, I'm catching myself up here for a second, guys. Um, sorry, I just wanna catch myself up. Um, they come over and um, tell us somewhere, okay. Hang on, I just wanna make sure that we cover this thought and I kind of went a little bit further um, than I wanted to right now, so just bear with me, okay? So we go over and we say that what, we reduce the asset to the new carrying value. Ah. It's so annoying the way they make this click and click and click to get what we want here. Okay, to the new cost basis, okay? Um, we still evaluate this in future periods for impairment. Again, that has to be done at least annually and no restoration impairment loss for an asset held for use is allowed. If it's held for disposals, we saw, then you could write it back up, but not in excess of the previously recognized losses. Okay, so you come over and um, that's what we're saying. Um, if the asset is to be disposed of, the rules are a little bit different. We can write it down, we must write it down, and we can write it back up 
as long as we don't exceed the original carrying amount. So you can only write it up to that original carrying amount. You can't write it up more than that. Now they tell us should losses or gains related to impairment, um, should report losses or gain of impairment uh, as part of income from continuing operations. Yes, unless the disposal that we're calculating, if we're looking at that asset for disposal, and that loss on disposal is in concert with the disposal of eliminating a segment, then that loss would be what part of the total calculation of a loss on discontinued operations and would be reported separately on the income statement net of tax, like you learned when you talked about the income statement earlier. So yes, if it's held for disposal, absolutely is part of continuing operations if it's held for use, I should say, if it's held for use, it's part of continuing operations, right? If the, absolutely, if the asset is held for disposal, okay, you're going to dispose of it, it will be continuing operations unless that loss that you calculated, that impairment loss that you calculated is part of an overall assessment of the loss from disposal of a segment, an entire segment of the business, not just one piece of equipment, then that would be uh, discontinued operations. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and move forward and start to talk about, uh, explain the accounting procedure for depletion of now natural resources, okay? Now these natural resources are called wasting assets, meaning that they're going to deplete, they're going to go away over time. So what happens? We buy a piece of land, and we don't buy the piece, piece of land because it has a nice view and we're gonna build our building on it or something. We buy that piece of land because we wanna get what's in there. We wanna take the coal out of the ground or we're gonna pull the side of a hill away because there it turns out that there's gravel in there or something that we can sell and uh, make some money on, okay? So that's called depletion, okay? Can be petroleum, minerals, timber, etc. okay? Now, what's going to happen is we're going to call the um, cost of taking those, we call that depletion. Now notice, guys, cost is a term that um, talks about the, what? It's not necessarily expense. Cost can go into inventory, Right? Think about it. We're not going to keep the coal and, you know, build a coal snowman with the coal. When we, we're going to sell it, right? Okay. Um, places like West Virginia, for example, they're all about pulling coal out of the ground, right? Okay. And so what happens? You sit there and you're pulling this coal out. You're not going to sit there and look at it. You're going to do what? You're going to sell it, right? So it's inventory. But then that inventory eventually will turn into a cost of goods sold as we actually sell that natural resource, whatever it is, okay? Now what happens? When we go and we calculate the depletion base, it's the original acquisition cost. It's exploration cost. We have to determine, we bought that piece of land, but we're thinking maybe there's some coal on there, but we're going to have to do some exploration to see if it's there or not. There's development cost. Development cost is what? Hey, I'm not going to be able to put a vacuum cleaner on the top of the land and suck the coal out. I'm going to have to make some, you know, they have those different, uh, um, you know, systems that allow them tracks and whatnot that allow them to go underground, way down there under the earth to get that coal, et cetera. That would be development cost. And then there's restoration costs. Look, the federal government comes down and they tell coal companies, if you think you're gonna leave that mess there when you're done, think again. You're gonna have to restore that and put a park there or something like that on top of the, um, on top of the, on, uh, to fix the land after you've ended up using it, okay? Now it could be too, although they don't really give that to us here, there could be a salvage value. In other words, after you uh, you know restore this land or whatever, you can go ahead and you can uh, sell it off to the city or something, or the city's agreed to buy it to you from you for some cost, or the federal government will buy it back from you. 
that would come off, okay? So acquisition cost is a plus to our depletion base. Exploration cost is, right? Development cost, yeah. Uh, restoration cost is going to add to that depletion base. Salvage value would be a subtract from that depletion base, okay? All right, good. Make sure you kind of get comfortable with the things that uh, affect our depletion base, okay? Now what happens? You go ahead and you have your total cost, which were all those pluses, minus the salvage value, that gives you your um, depletion, depletable base. Then you divide that by the number of units that you think will um, come out of that, and that's an engineering estimate. Again, that's not the accountant's job. I don't have an account, as an accountant, I don't have to sit here and say, yeah, that's how much coal's in there. That's not my job. Somebody will give me that number, and then that gives me my depletion cost per unit, and then I take the units extracted, how much coal did I put out of the ground, pull out of the ground, times the cost per unit, that gives me my depletion, my depletion, and my depletion could be what? Could be contained in inventory, okay? Or if I sell that inventory, then it's going to go to what? Cost of goods sold. So be careful because I think I, I'm gonna probably try to trick you up. Then I'm gonna say, well, calculate the cost of goods sold and you're gonna calculate the entire depletion number and the depletion is not all an income statement item. It first hits the balance sheet, right? And then as you actually sell those items, it goes to the income statement as a cost of goods sold. Okay, okay, good. So let's just look at this numeric example and they tell us that they have these different costs coming in here. They have to pay a lease cost of 50,000. They have exploration cost of 100,000. And um, they say that they have a development cost of uh, 850000 Now, in this example, um, they didn't buy the land. They simply leased the land, and they're going to take, uh, take the whatever it is, what is it, silver here, out of this thing. Okay, now they believe that they can get 100,000 units of silver out of here. So if you add the 50 plus the 100... Okay, that's 150,000 plus the 850. That's how they came up to this million. So you can see it's important that you know what costs are to go into that um, base. And then again, you know, in this example, there wasn't any restoration cost because they were leasing the property. If you buy the property and then you go and you, you know, chump the thing up, uh, the federal government through uh, the Office of Surface Mining is the entity that would be in charge of making sure you clean that up. They don't do a very good job. I was on an assignment where um, we were looking at entities that don't really collect fines and penalties when I worked for the Government Accountability Office. And Office of Surface Mining was one of the worst ones at collecting the penalties when uh, entities mess up the environment. Okay, but. Uh, generally you're supposed to clean that up okay so we have a million and that would be a part of the cost and then if you were able to sell it back that would be a subtract but uh, they didn't give us every single one of them here but it's important that you know how to handle these different things that we had on this slide and how they affect your depletion base okay but once you've got your depletion base your cost per unit they're doing per ounce here okay and then you go ahead and they extracted 25,000 ounces. So you take that cost per unit times the number of units that were extracted. And so your depletion is 250,000. You would go ahead and debit inventory 250,000, credit the silver mine asset, right? Because you had set up that asset, you would have debited silver mine asset a million dollars. Um, when you originally uh, went ahead and uh, incurred those costs and then you would go ahead and in this case you uh, credit directly we don't have an accumulated depletion account we have simply uh, credit that to the silver mine the, directly to the asset account we don't credit the contra account um, you know accumulated depletion now if you sell um, no, I say that and then they go ahead and make a liar out of me, okay? Because uh, right here would be the accumulated depletion count that would have been credited there. So I'm not sure why they didn't call this accumulated 
uh, depletion rather than credit it directly to the silver mine account. Make up your mind book. Okay, you can do it uh, either way, um, but if they're going to show it to us this way, then I think the journal entry should have been consistent. You don't have to go directly to the silver mine account. You could do this accumulated depletion. Hello, book. Do me a favor and be consistent. Don't make me look stupid. Okay, so you have either option, uh, but if you made this journal entry, you wouldn't have had this account. No account is exist unless you made a journal entry to it. So anyway, okay, so that gives us now the amount of depletion. Now, as you sell that asset, let's say we sold 10,000 ounces, then of course you would, what, 10,000 uh, times the $10 would be 100,000. You would debit cost of goods sold, 100,000, and you would credit um, inventory as you sell that thing. Just like selling of any inventory. Okay, that's a debit to 10,000 to cost of goods sold as you sell it. Okay, okay, good. Okay, that's what they're saying there. That's what you see there. Okay, all right, good. Um, and then it would be very similar if you have a change in what you're able to um, deplete, then you would go ahead and basically uh, do that change in accounting estimate and go forward with that new estimate. Okay, all right, good. I'm not gonna go back through that part now. Um, just they say continuing controversy. And what this is talking about is for um, the uh, gas and oil uh, accounting industry. And uh, if you were to get a job with say Chevron, this would be important. Um, but I just wanna give you a, just a very basic sense of this idea of a dry hole uh, method versus the uh, successful efforts method or full costing versus the successful efforts method and what the um, uh, dry hole method says is the cost needed to find the uh, commercially profitable wells is just gone ahead and expensed as that ha as that happens uh, or I should say full cost method says I, I misstated that so let me restate that full cost method says that you're going to capitalize all the cost, even those costs associated with uh, land that you purchase that ends up not yielding any oil, okay? That's called the full cost method. Successful efforts method says, I'm only gonna capitalize the cost of those um, projects that actually yield some oil. If I have a dry hole, I go ahead and I drill for oil and there's nothing there, I would expense the cost of the dry holes. And so those are two different methods. And again, I'm not gonna test you on that, but I thought since they put that here, that might be a little bit interesting since uh, you know Chevron is kind of a big important company in California. And so there's a chance that some of you might get an opportunity. So give you a little bit of something. If you wanna read more about that in the text, you could look at that. Okay, I think that's a pretty good effort for our first class, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and end things there, okay? Um, I will be posting up, it's looking like probably tomorrow, a, a set, a, a practice midterm with a set of questions, and I'll put a lecture with those questions as well. So stay tuned for that. You should look at those practice, practice midterm when I put it up and then go ahead and mess around with some of those homework questions that you can see in Wiley Plus. All right, guys. Hopefully that was helpful, and we'll talk soon, okay?